any subject. Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Jay Fidel. We're talking about community matters. And today we're talking about abortions beyond state borders with Cynthia Sinclair, uh, one of our hosts who has, has a number of shows on Think Tech, uh, and Kimi Ide Foster, who is a actually a practicing lawyer and associated with uh, the Hawaii Women's Lawyers, which is right. Am I right? So, so this is great, you know. And we're going to talk about this topic because this is something we need to follow. It's an it's a moving target. I hate to use that term, um, but you know, it is not over. It won't be over. It is part of the uh, what do you want to call it? The American political landscape, and it will be for years to come. And uh, even even the events in Ukraine are not going to are not going to ameliorate the the difference of opinion we have in this country. I might also add, you know, that if the Catholic Church in Rome were to say, we do not oppose abortion anymore, wouldn't that pull the rug out from all of this fighting and controversy? Yeah. Just one statement by the sure Pope. Would. Yeah. 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 Well, well Cynthia, let's go with you first. Uh, let's talk about the, the state of affairs in the Missouri statute that's mentioned in this article, um, which appeared, what, in the New York Times about abortions beyond state borders and how the people, the Republican legislature in Missouri wants to change things to reach beyond the borders of Missouri. Well, it's not just Missouri. It's Texas, it's Idaho, it's, isn't there four, I think there's four other states that are, if they're not doing it, they're poised and ready to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the part that gets me. America has always been against vigilantism. It has been uh, from all the way back to, you know, Western days. You don't, it, this whole Everything, this mentality that they've got going, it reminds me of mob rule. And it's like, how can, just because I think it doesn't mean you have to do it. And that's what, you know, America has always been this very rooted in that, that mentality of anti-vigilantism. And this is exactly vigilantism. It is encouraging people to, Sue people. If I give someone a ride, say I lived in Idaho or Texas, and I gave someone a ride to California to have an abortion, when I came back, I could be sued for that. That's just ridiculous. And then one step further, there's people now, they're saying in this specific one with Missouri, I think, they're saying that um, if you have sex in Missouri and get pregnant in Missouri, even if you're from Illinois and it's legal to have an abortion in Illinois, or I don't know for sure. I'm just using that as an example because I think Illinois is one of the states that's not. <laughs> but um, at any rate, you know, so if you just get pregnant in that state, it is illegal for you to have an abortion in any other state. That is ridiculously outrageous. And every time I see anything from these crazy, almost rabid people that are anti-abortion, is that they you mean, all- You mean the people that say, my, my body, my right, don't touch me, uh, don't make me wear a mask or have a mm -hmm. vaccine, it's oh, my right, liberty, are... freedom, you know, all that. Right? Oh, that the irony. Yep. That. Exactly. Every time I see that, my body, my choice thing, I just- scream and have to turn off the TV because I can't watch anymore. It's ridiculous to, to it's not for them to not see the hypocrisy in what they're doing. It's yeah. Well Kimmy, let me let me turn to you about um, you know the what the national federal system. Mm -hmm. um, and what it means, for example, for California to adopt a, a whole bunch of, like, they, they haven't done it yet, but uh, there's a movement to do it. It's pending, whole, yep. You know, non-cooperation uh, mm -hmm. with any state that wants to reach, like Missouri, that wants to reach outside its borders. Um, can, you, can you talk to us about what California has in mind and maybe other, you know, pro-abortion states have in mind? And can you tell us what that means within the federal system on the basis of which this country is organized? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, a little bit of background here is that, of course, we know right now, 
as of today, um, which is likely to change in the next few weeks, maybe a few months, Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. Um, it's federally constitutionally enshrined. Technically, everybody is supposed to abide by it. Um, what we are seeing now is a slow chipping, well, we were starting to see a slow chipping away at Roe. And what we are now looking at is just a tidal wave. We, we're gonna live in a post, post Roe world. Um, I was telling Cynthia prior to this that I sit on the board for Planned Parenthood Affili uh, Advocates Affiliates, which is the national board that covers, I think, six states now. Um, and we have just seen so much fallout from this as people are getting ready for it. Because these states, like, like you were saying, Cynthia, Texas, all of these states, I think we estimated after the Texas SB8 ban went into effect, we saw an 800% increase. That's crazy. That's absolutely bananas. Um, so what states like California are trying to do is they're going the opposite direction. They're saying, okay, if you're going to make this as a state's rights issue, which it's not, but if it's going to come down to a state's rights issue, fine. You want to play that way? We will too. We don't have to comply with you. We don't have to turn over people to you. Um, you know, California has a history of doing this. I believe, I don't know if you guys remember, but um, kind of during the Trump years, California just refused to comply with ICE. They were just like, nope. We're not doing it. Um, you know, bless California. I, I love those people. And and honestly, that's that's what states have to do is being if if these other states want to say, like, okay, we're gonna do this on a state by state basis, then pro states have to be willing to stand up and say, then fine, this is a safe haven. Um, other states that have been doing that is Washington, I think, is on the eve of passing a bill that would make it a safe harbor state as well. Um Hawaii is very, very close. I mean, Hawaii's protections have always been, thank God, very, very good. Um, are there constitutional yeah, We were one of the first states to allow We abortion. sure were. We yeah. were. And um, the clean the bill right now is honestly just tech cleanups that makes it obvious that it's open to everybody. It is gender affirming and getting rid of some kind of archaic criminal sanctions that have been on the books, but it, to my knowledge, have never actually been used. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we can do is you make it available for these people to come here and you make it easy for them to come here. And I think this is getting a little off the legal track, but one of the things that that article you sent us talked about, and one of the things that we try to encourage people at Planned Parenthood is, you know, donating money to organizations that can pool resources across state lines is huge. That is the number one thing people can do um, because like you said, it's, it's crazy. You can sue an Uber driver. You can sue the, the neighbor who drove you across. That's, that's bananas. And so having resources where you're going to have to fight it, and God knows if any of these are going to stick, but part of the problem with dealing with a legal suit is you still have to go to court. You have to get an attorney. You have to go through the process and take time off your job. Like, besides the trauma to the poor, you know, I'm going to say victim, it's everybody else that's get pulled into this that don't have a monetary wherewithal necessarily. So that's that's my take on this. And well, I know you I'm describe a, a you describe angry. a situation of the po uh, the post uh, row post row world. world. And the indeed the article talks about that. We were on, on the threshold of a post row world. And I guess that means mm -hmm. everybody assumes, and I like your take on this, everybody assumes that as soon as the uh, the court gets its hands uh, begins to speak, and then, uh, what do I think that'll be soon, like the latest the October term, um, they will they will uh, they will say that a, a state, any state has the right um, under the this um, section eight. Bill 8, whatever you call it, uh, Texas legislation or any Missouri mm -hmm. legislation um, mm -hmm. to outlaw and to make criminal and to do this vigilante kind of thing uh, against uh, abortion. And so half the states in the country will jump on that um, and, and we, will, we will be outlawing abortion completely in half the states. And, and the other part, and I want to ask Cynthia about this in a minute, is, is how the anti-abortion forces react to that, because the article touches on what they will do uh, when this happens. But my question to you, Kimmy, is um, mm -hmm. no, we, we have chaos. It's chaos. It's it madness, and no question. It's absolute madness. And, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's take the 
mm, partisan element out of the Supreme Court for a minute, just for a moment. <laughs> Imagine with me, almost in a fictitious world, a reasonable, impartial Supreme Court that is bent on doing the right thing for the country, okay? <laughs> what would it hold now, given the chaos among the states? Oh, it, I mean, absent a compelling reason, and I'm thinking of things like Brown v. Board of Education. I'm thinking, you know, those are those are landmark decisions. Absent a compelling reason, a previously decided decision is the law of the land. You don't take it up. You don't dismantle it. There's no reason for it, frankly. And they're doing. I mean, if if in your perfect world, Jay, I would God, I'd love to live there right now. Um, if this was, you know, a, a nonpartisan court who wasn't hell bent on taking away women's rights, minority rights, immigrant rights they would let Roe stand because frankly, Texas, you have no business doing this. You know, Indiana, you have no business doing this. Kentucky, what are you doing? Like there are certain things that are left to the states and there are certain things that as a matter of either law or judicial decision have been decided at the federal level. Roe is a federal decision. It is the law of the land. You don't get to just say, I think Cynthia was saying like, eh, I'm opting out. You know, like that's not how that works. And that's, to me, that's just crazy that people are, that they're doing this under the guise of states' rights. And it's like, no, you're, you're reaching a little too far here. There's, there's absolutely no basis for you to be doing this. You don't have any basis to overturn this and kick it back to the states. This is not a, you know, police matter. You know, states are entitled to police their borders how they want to. This is something that has been enshrined in our federal law, and it should stay there. So. Yeah, and the circumstances um, that existed at the time Roe was decided are really mm -hmm. the same. The, the world, uh, the same. our society has not changed. This is a nope. strictly political issue. Well, I want to come back to you in a minute about, um, sure. you know, the Supreme Court, because um, it's turning out to be a huge disappointment. I want to talk to you about that. Um, but Cynthia, you know, uh, the article suggests, this is very interesting, is that after, in a post-Roe world coming soon, okay, the, th there'll be more trouble and um, there'll be attacks of one kind or another on states which do what California is, is uh, thinking of doing and, and Washington is thinking of doing, and for that matter, what Hawaii is thinking of doing to frustrate these attempts to reach beyond the border of a, an anti-abortion state. Um, this is very frightening because this means that the states will not only reach uh, women who have abortions out of state, but they will reach providers uh, who are doing abortions out of state, even though those providers have nothing to do uh, with the original state. Um, what do you think will happen? Uh, this is this is very troubling. What do you think will happen, and how will it how will it work out? Well, all people that are involved, even nurses, you know, not just the doctors that do the um, or the nurse practitioners that that do the abortions, but anybody who works in the clinic is at risk. And, and that's a big problem. It's been a problem for a very long time, even in a, in a pre-Roe, even during the Roe world, you know? Um, so there's a thing called states at home, um, laws that can be put into effect. And, and then the addresses and the zip codes of the providers and the people who work there are not actually given out to the public. Um, that's just the first step. But, um... you know, activists have blown clinics up. Yeah, activists yeah. have yeah. shot yeah. providers. Yep. Yeah, um, the name of life. That could happen anywhere in, a, in an anti-abortion state or in an abortion mm -hmm. state. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. no reason why one of those crazy activists couldn't cross the line and go shoot up a clinic in a state where it's legal. Right? Mm -hmm. Not could, mm -hmm. but will. Um, there's, there's no gray area here. We don't have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They've already established who they are. They, they stand there with a pro-life sign and then shoot somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, none of it makes any sense. In that, in that sense, 70%, this is an important thing, 70%. When every time they do a poll, 70% of Americans are okay with abortion. So what's, 
you know, there's some sort of a, I, you know, I just am always hoping we can make peace here in the midst of all of this. Some sort of a, you know, is there a way we can make an agreement that, you know, it's only to a certain, say, 12? Well, what, about, what about the notion that the majority rules? Well, uh, you, isn't that isn't that in the Constitution? Yeah, I think so. Isn't that in Robert's Rules of Order? I mean, it's everywhere, but we seem to have forgotten that notion. Well, obviously, because Republicans are all about minority rule. They know they're in the minority and they can't wait to get back in control of Congress and the White House because they know. They yeah. the okay, well, I want to ask you one more thing, and that is the pill that gives you an abortion. I, I, I'm afraid I don't know too much about it, but it's, it's, it's obviously it's a, techno a technology that works. Uh, it's being used. How does all of this affect the use, the distribution, um, the legality of a pill like that? Well, you know, when it was the pandemic, there were special laws that were made so that they could mail out prescriptions. So maybe they could find some sort of a something in that sense. All I know is every single person that claims to be anti-abortion and wants all this to go forward is saying that it's okay to rape somebody or abuse them, incest, and they still can't go and get an abortion. They have to be tortured because this person thinks that that baby's more important. And then those same people, those same Republicans, vote no on any kind of social welfare. So, you know, they, they're, they're just hypocrites, is what yeah, they are. Yeah, it's a true fact. But what about the pill? <laughs> How does it work? Is it in general distribution? How does this all affect the use of the pill? Can the pill um, get by all of the trouble we're having on the issue? Well, I think it has to be used in before a certain time in and before a certain you know month. So maybe Kimmy knows more about the specifics of how the pill works because I am not familiar with that. One. Okay, Kimmy, do you know about that? You want to comment on that? Uh, I know a little bit about it. So I think you're talking about what's commonly known as Plan B, right? Yeah. Uh, so plan B, it's it's very, very early on. Um, ironically, I believe and don't quote me, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, um, but it would be effective within those six weeks, which is the, the trigger ban. I think it's even affected up to, you know, eight weeks, maybe 12. Um, but it's now 12 is a little bit long, maybe eight weeks. But at any rate, it's it definitely would be effective. And like Cynthia was saying, during the pandemic, once the more progressive states started making it available via mail, which was fantastic. Um, it's, it's kind of always baffled my mind that you have to go in for a full exam and do a full physical exam for an oral ingestion. That's, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, like you also want to be home because the after effects can be traumatic on your body. Um, and so I, I think that I, I, no, I think, I know there are definitely some States and I cannot remember the off the top of my head that are trying to stop even the administration of the pill, which is just crazy. I don't know how, and to your point earlier, Jay, about the Catholic Church, a lot of these people root their arguments in the morality of, you know, vitality of life and life begins at conception. But I'm sorry, that is just a load of crap. Like right in the first, in the first two to three weeks, that has as much sentience as a scab on my arm. Like it is the same thing. It is a cluster of cells that has it is not thinking independently for me at all. It is just sitting there, it is occupying space, and that's it. You know, so the, I, I would love to say the pill is a way out of it, but I think if these states have their way, they're going to get rid of all of it because it has nothing to do with, and I think what Cynthia was alluding to here, it has nothing to do with the morality argument or women or abortion in general. I think it has everything to do with controlling women's bodies and controlling minority populations. And, you know, God forbid you let them get up off the farm because they might start thinking and reading and having ideas. And like, what would we do then if the, if the country gets more diverse and people actually have a chance to plan their families? Like, you can't put them on welfare. Oh my gosh, oh, horrible. And I think that's what it comes down to is that that's what they're worried about. It's, it's not abortion as a morality clause. It's, you know, all of a sudden women. women have been- It's about women. women. Been, right, right. <laughs> We let you vote, we let you own property, and now we're gonna let you control your own destiny? Like that's just too far. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much. Cynthia, you wanted to add? 
you wanted to add to that. I can oh. see you were getting very excited about it. <laughs> I was going to jump in only because I wanted to see. <laughs> I think traumatic is the wrong word. I have friends that have used that pill. Um, and no, I, I think it depends. I've, I've had, I've also had some friends who've had some bad reactions, but some who have no reaction whatsoever. So, oh, okay. So I guess just yeah. the people I know had no reaction. Depends. Yeah. It depends on who you are. Okay. Well, I have a question on the very, very subject. Um, and it's, it's addressed to, to, to Kimi. Kimi. Sure. Um, it says, uh, North, North, uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire just passed a bill making it legal to deny the purchase of birth control medication what? at the store slash cashier's discretion based on their own beliefs. That is the belief of the store and the cashier. Um, what are your thoughts on this and how does it relate to other efforts in other states? This blows my mind. That, that's, <laughs> the the I, cashier I will that. decide. That's horrible. I mean, this sounds to me like it's an extension of the whole Hobby Lobby, like religious exemption. And if I, if I don't think it's right, which doesn't stand, it doesn't make any sense. But the problem with, and this is the same problem with somewhere like Texas or New Hampshire, is that if they pass the law, somebody is now going to have to go and challenge it, bring it up to the state courts, and then it's going to go, you know, the state court's going to go to appeal, it'll go to the state Supreme Court. If it gets all the way there, then you'll take it to the federal system. And so while I think that that is complete and total BS, and I don't think it's legal, I don't, it's, it's been tested, it's not legal. It's going to take a while to undo the damage. And that's one of the most dangerous things about bills like this is that even if it doesn't stand in the end, and I hope it doesn't, but Obviously, they're a lot more conservative than I realized. Um, people will have been hurt already. Like the damage is done, you know. And and we've seen, what we've seen in Texas, and that's really terrifying in New Hampshire, is that other states see states doing things like that and think, ah, it's a good idea. Copycat bans, you know. And whether or not it should stand at the federal level, it has to go through the state process first. So it's. And like I think you said this earlier, Jay, it's just a mess. I, I yeah, I take your point. And um, why does this remind me of all these bizarre uh, voting statutes that that are being mm -hmm. adopted all around the country? Mm -hmm. And I, I take your point, Kimi, that um, this creates confusion. While it is in court, nobody knows which end is up. So, Cynthia, how how do we deal with this? I mean, it's really I'm wrapping around, you know, both um, both all of these bills about ador abortion, but also about voting. We have a state of confusion in the federal system now where you don't know which end is up. The, the, the guy in the in the department store or rather in the in the what do you call it? Uh, 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 the store. <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess it's a it's a drugstore, you know. Um, he's confused, or she, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, you know the, the 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 people who administer the voting and the voters, they're confused, and and the public, and, including women who would like to have an abortion mm -hmm. in another state, you know, they don't know which end is up. They 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 you know you and it changes. I mean, we we have some good articles lately in the in the Times, but uh, let me assure you, there are other articles in other newspapers and, and um, you know, right-wing channels around the country, radio and TV, that are making it much more confusing. I don't know which, which way to go. What can you do? They may take these, these bills and statutes much more seriously uh, than the guy who wrote the article that I circulated to you. <clears throat> so how do we deal with this? This is um, kind of a plenary confusion about critical issues. Unfortunately... The Republicans started this move long before now so that they now control so many legislative houses in so many different states. They do not represent what the majority of the American people want. They represent what their small slice wants. And until... Um, I think we need three parties for one. And I think that until people get involved at the, and I've been saying this, Jay, you know this, I've been saying this for a long time. People need to get involved at the base level. That, you know, we- you wouldn't use that term base. Oh, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> um, grassroots. At the grassroots. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, 
it, but that we get it involved at the, at the macro level, you know, mm -hmm. at the micro level, that we start going out and uh, running for office, run for office, vote in the little elections, the local elections, vote for who your mayor is, who your school board members are, who, vote, vote, vote. It's in funny, you know, there is an organization called Run For Something, runforsomething.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, the CEO is a woman named Littman. Uh, I remember this because it left such an impression on me to find out about it. And, and it's exactly what you're saying. You know, don't sit in your chair. And you're not an, mm -hmm. an, you can't be an armchair participant. You have to actually do it. And that's why, you know, she's doing this uh, website. And I'm sure she has a lot of thoughts about the issues we're talking today. So I want to go, I want to, go to a larger point, though, uh, Kimmy. And, and, mm -hmm. and I talked about this with Abby Seufer, um, you know, the dean, the former dean of the law school. Um, Love Abby, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, my concern, our concern is uh, the Supreme Court, because it's, it's, it's really um, taking the country in the wrong direction. And it's, it's wrecking our... The most important thing is public confidence in the government, you know, mm -hmm. the social fabric by which we all agree on fundamental points, values. And the Supreme Court is, is dousing that one after the other. You can't say it's 100 percent of the time, but it's, it's surely over 90 percent of the pretty time. Pretty close. They are pretty close. They're wrecking us. OK. Mm -hmm. And so what you know, you're an attorney. I'm sure you think about this. I know I think about it. Um, the Supreme Court is a failure, man. It's a failure right now, today. Mm -hmm. Nobody has confidence they will do the right thing. What do we do? I make you today here, I appoint you the commission that was supposed <laughs> to come up <laughs> to com come up with something. Judicial review. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, it, yes, I do think about this often, Jay. I think, I mean, the hardest part to me there's a couple of things going on in my head right now is that, you know, on the one hand, the lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court was meant to be a balance to the other two branches and that you have one branch that moves very, very slowly. You have Congress that moves, you know, at a eh, rate and you have the president that changes out every four years or eight years, um, depending on how, how they're doing. Um, and I think while people were generally good, educated, fair, um, I think that that worked. I think that that was the model that, that worked. What we've seen recently, and to reiterate your point, is this is a train wreck. I mean, it has just become the mouthpiece. It's, it's the Trump hangover at this point. And all it's doing is kicking us back to the 1950s in every way possible. I'm sorry, did and, you say the 1950s or the 1850s? Uh, both, honestly. Um, <laughs> but it's, and, and what people can do is, if, what I would do is I, I honestly don't really have an answer for this, unfortunately. Um, I've thought about this a lot, and I think some of it comes down to, like Cynthia was saying, for God's sakes, vote. Like, get out there and start making noise because you elect the people that confirm or not confirm these, these judges at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, I would love to have some sort of judicial review board where you have an independent biparty system where you look at these decisions and you can see if they comport with law, but that undermines so many of our basic federal tenets. It's like, where do you start going with this? When do you start rewriting the constitution? And when you open that can of worms, it's a whole mess. Um, and so I, I don't know what to do at this point. And I think that's what's frustrating so many people is it's like, you feel like a speck in the grass because there are these, the nine sitting there making these decisions that affect people all across the country for generations, and they're never going to have to feel the effects of their policies. That's what drives me the most nuts: is that they are so far in their ivory towers, they're they're okay. They don't have to worry about how it feels. Um, and so, nor do they have to worry about recusing themselves. They never have to worry about recusing themselves. Where, where their it's, it's wives nice. do very bizarre things oh my in God. the insurrection context. I cannot believe. I know. I I have a whole list of things that I think about Justice Thomas. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's frustrating because once, I, I mean, we're seeing two effects. Once they say it's law, it's supposed to say law, but they're also doing this weird thing where they're picking and choosing and they're going to start kicking things back that they know the states will overturn. And so they have now made themselves, you know, judges aren't supposed to make law. They're supposed to interpret and rule on the law. And they have made themselves a lawmaking body. 
Yes. And that is not acceptable. That goes against every principle of constitutionality we have. It runs against federalism. It runs against common sense. You already have a lawmaking body. That's the legislature. And I don't know what else people can do other than, okay, like I said before, if this is going to become a state's thing, we got to shore up on our side. We have to start, you know, putting these protections into place. But in the long term, short of, you know, getting rational, reasonable people in there that will confirm people in a timely manner, maybe adding a couple more justices, I wouldn't be opposed to that either because it's a little weird that nine people decide the fate of the entire country and more viewpoints would probably help. Um, maybe some kind of, I don't know, threshold or diversity DEI initiative would be wonderful, but how do you how do you put that into practice with the, the Supreme Court? You know, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Other than to say, I'm no, not sure. I mean, <laughs> I've always thought that you you know it, it would be very positive if you if you gave them a course, uh, call it uh, uh, judicial temperament, judicial reasonableness uh, 101, and they had to get at least a B average. You know, <laughs> you mean I, don't, I don't think they would know. get that. <laughs> Uh, Cynthia, I want to go to you with my Dickensian question. I, I always like asking about the, the ghost of Christmas future, okay? So right now, we were on the precipice of a, of a post row world. We're in the precipice of a lot of states um, following, you know, this uh, right-wing movement about abortion and other things for that matter. Uh, we're on the precipice of uh, confusion and fragmentation around the country. Um, and 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 fear, a fear on the part of women who don't know what to do and whose lives will be upset, whose uh, you know whose careers will be upset, who will wind up without the funds to have an abortion or without the will um, or the clarity uh, to cross state lines and have an abortion, um, and they will be profoundly affected in their lives. And, and okay, that's, that's clinical, that's one person. But now I'm gonna give you the Dickensian question, um, the ghost of Christmas future. Suppose I give you 330 million people who are all concerned and all afraid and all having children they don't want. What kind of a country do I have demographically with a lot of kids that were not wanted? Um, I think that the answer to that is sort of obvious, yes? And it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. You've got people that walk around with PTSD from not being wanted. They know that when you are, when you just, children that are abused, and that is a form of abuse. Neglect is a form of abuse. If you don't want your kid, you're going to neglect them. They're going to be having to deal with the PTSD of that. They're going to grow up to be narcissistic jerks. So we're going to have a country full of narcissistic jerks. Oh, how wonderful. Doesn't that sound fun? Well, they should all join the Republican Party, eh? Sarcastic. sarcastic. Pardon me? I'm wait. sorry I said that. Oh, no, wait. Why did you say all I heard was the Republican Party? Never mind. <laughs> Maybe it's good that's all I heard, right? <laughs> That sounds like the Republican Party, actually. It's, you know, um, it, it's hard to know how things will go because they're going to be just reversed back. And we haven't talked about what it was like in the 1950s when people were going to back, you know, back alley doctors. There weren't even doctors to get their abortions because they were going to have them anyway, right? And so they, they're, they're dying. So we've got mothers and babies dying all the time because they get sepsis and they die painful deaths. The sepsis is terrible from that. And so the, the possibilities of horrific damage to women is just a little more than I can stand. And I, I scream at the TV about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question for you, Kimi. <laughs> you know, and you and I have talked about this, is, um, you know, the, in the bar, you take an oath. Uh, in the bar, you have a professional obligation. Every lawyer, which distinguishes a lawyer from other people, 
um, has a special obligation to the community. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you is what, and lawyers have really not weighed in on this, the Bar Association, American Bar Association, no, nothing, no. nothing, and, and many other Trump, Trump type issues, nothing. So what's missing here? Why is that? And what should a right thinking, thoughtful, committed, patriotic, if I can use that term, a lawyer do in order to change things? Because after all, we are the merchants of the law. I love that, Jay. Um, well, one, I think the reason that, you know, the ABA and other organizations like that have not weighed in on it is that there's that bizarre, archaic moral stigma that they, you know, God forbid you get involved in something that's a little bit controversial. Um, you know, it's one thing if there's already a, a, a clear national movement like Me Too, ABA came out and weighed in on Me Too, which was fantastic, finally, but it also waited until it was clear that the country was not going backwards. Um, and something like this, it, you're right, it drives me nuts. I, I don't know why people don't say things, but I think, you know, it's, I, I completely agree with you in terms of our role in society is that we were blessed to be a part of something. And we have the education and the tools and the know-how. Um, so to the extent you can, I mean, volunteer, go educate people. There are community programs, you know, Planned Parenthood does community education programs. Volunteer your time as, I mean, this is not legal, but as a lawyer, you're probably a little more thick skinned than the average community because you get yelled at all the time, either by <laughs> your, your own client, counsel, judges, <laughs> like you're, you're used to just kind of being like, okay, sure, like brush it off. Um, but do things like volunteer to walk people to clinics, walk people in and out of clinics, show up at educational events, um, volunteer in schools, volunteer with universities, all of those things. Volunteer your time even as a counselor. Like you don't necessarily need to understand the educational law, but you have a way of thinking. You have learned how to logically process and you've learned how to communicate information that you should be putting to use in the community. You know, if somebody calls and says like, is this legal? Just know you know the answer. You may like, I, I know a lot, a fair amount about what's legal and what's not legal in terms of traffic speeding. Am I the person you want to call for traffic court? No. Do I still volunteer for things like access to justice? Yes, because that's my responsibility. And that's our responsibility is, you know, take the education you've had and put it to use, make it accessible to other people. Thank you, Kimmy. Cynthia, you look so <laughs> excited there. I, I want to <laughs> offer you the, the opportunity to close. What would you like to leave with our listeners? Timmy's awesome. <laughs> you <laughs> are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> you those things that were like making my heart warm. I was like, <laughs> you are really great. And I'm really glad you were on the show with us today. And I'm glad I was on the show with you guys to hear this because it's my honor, honestly, Jay. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you, Kimmy. Thank you, Cynthia. Great discussion. Thank you so much for speaking out on this. Aloha.